کیا ویس جب بھی آتا ہے جب بات صاحب اور خواتین بھائی صاحب I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, meeting in which Javid Jabbar Sahib will be the first speaker <coughs> and yours truly, always in a secondary position, will be the second speaker. Javid will speak for 30 minutes, 30 minutes, and I, uh, he has allowed me to speak for three hours. <laughs> But however, I will also limit my presentation to 30 minutes and then there will be a question and answer session. <clears throat> um, as you all know, the loss of uh, East Pakistan was a great catastrophe which changed not only our country, divided it into two, but also was, as Javed suggested, in the topic for this meeting, it was also an international milestone. I don't really need to go into a great, into great detail about introducing Javed Jabbar Sahib. He is a well-known public figure in this country, one of the most well-known. He has been a senator. He has been federal minister. He is a media mogul. He is a film producer, he is a man of many causes, and a man of many seasons. And la lately he has written a book, it is a completely new concept called Pakistanian, in which he has spelled out, as he has seen it, the various dimensions of what it means to be a Pakistani. And I recommend that everybody should read that. He has spoken on this issue in another gathering, and I believe uh, that he is going to join a marathon issue again on the 28th of this month on the same subject. But we are very fortunate that he has given us this time, and very fortunate indeed because he is also a member of this institute. So Javed will speak on the loss of East Pakistan, uh, national calamity and an international. You chair this uh, extraordinary institution uh, with uh, grace, with wisdom, and with strength, and with exclusion, and with exclusion and discrimination. I was told by reliable sources that in this splendid, unique library, there are only three books out of the 15 books I've written. Thank you so much <laughs> for excluding 12 books. I mean, I've been blacklisted. We are, we are very selective. <laughs> <laughs> not as selective as you should be in admitting suspicious characters like myself to be members of the institute. One grew up in this library. Uh, as a student of the Department of International Relations, University of Karachi, uh, mashallah. This has so many meanings for me. But it's also such a pleasure to see so many reiterate that it truly was a national tragedy. G, how is it a national tragedy? <laughs> Ubhar Chuki had 48 years, my God, almost half a century. Or do nay nasle wale ho bhi hai. And is it, is, is, bhul jani chahiye hai hai. Should we forget? Does it have to be remembered? Kahavat hai na, about a nation. In order to become a nation, it is essential that you forget because it is too painful to remember some parts of the past. Uh, if you start remembering everything that's happened, uh, you cannot think about the cohesion and the intimacy that belongs to a community. So, let us attempt it nevertheless and attempt it with some purpose. 
revisit the past, to reappraise it, uh, to review what we think was right and what was wrong, and perhaps also from that to resolve. I don't quite know whether humanity has the capacity to learn from history. Uh, if it did, then it would be not committing so many uh, repetitive uh, blunders that we have seen in not only Pakistan history, but throughout the world. And it bears remembering that after 30 years of religious-based war in Europe, when they drew up the Treaty of Westphalia, uh, first and foremost, sovereignty, respect for territory, demarcation of frontiers was born. And yet, in less than two to three hundred years later, after continuing this fratricidial conflict, uh, there were those two great, terrible world wars in the very continent that claimed to have brought civilization to the rest of the world. And uh, not content with those two world wars, uh, what they did in uh, Yugoslavia's aftermath, what happened in Bosnia uh, by the characters from Croatia and Serbia is another apt story of how we do not learn from history. So, East and West Pakistan, in my view it was a dream state. There had never been a state like uh, Two almost equal uh, halves of the population. No similarity in language, ethnicity, even culture. So brought together like a dream and a dream that turns into a nightmare. And why did it become a nightmare? Gee. Because, first of all, when you look at uh, the, how a state is defined, the West Failure defined it, a state is a body of territory whose demarcation is agreed upon by itself and by other states. But you do not find unanimity on the definition of the nation. The Oxford English Dictionary tries to define a nation, but subliminally, perhaps, or deliberately, it does not include the word religion. It says people who share a race or a, or a history or a language. Curious that they do not use religion. And yet, as we know, religion is a strong binding force, not just in Pakistan. As we know, there are other other examples. So what I did was some years ago in an earlier book from the one that Dr. Masuma very kindly referred to, which I hope, Ms. Chairman, Chairperson, this book, Galti Se Yaga Hi Aapki Library Mein, Ye Wale. What one has done is looked at about uh, the total membership of the UN and divided it into six categories. The first one, historical nation states like China, Russia, uh, Turkey, Greece, Iran, same territory, same ethnicity, more or less the same language. Migratory nation states from Europe, people who went out to North America, South America, Central America, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, took over the land, and ironically today, some of the most advanced and stable countries of the world are migratory nation states. Can we go back, please? Yeah, permutated nation states, which uh, really characters like Germany and Italy, fiefdoms warring with each other for several hundreds of years, brought together by strong leadership in the 19th century, Germany and Italy, Cavour, Mazzini, uh, and Garibaldi in Italy, Bismarck in Germany, permutated nation states. And then post-colonial, some might want to put Pakistan or India into that, but they don't belong there. India comes close to it. It is a post-colonial nation state. There was no such thing as an Indian nation state before 1947. But the fourth category, is really described or reflected by countries like Ghana and Kenya and Iraq and Jordan, which have never existed in history in the territory that they now occupy. And they were carved out by the colonial powers like France and Britain 
before they left from their own point of view. Fifth, born from disintegrated states, Pakistan was at the forefront, but then came the Soviet Union, 15 new states, uh, Yugoslavia, and several others. Sixth, religion-based, uh, to which we belong. And yet, and yet, Pakistan is unlike any other religion-based state. Um, itne anokhe. Saudi Arabia, eh, custodian of the holiest places of Islam. Israel, the place where Moses was born. Uh, Christ was born. Israel has a right to that territory. Pakistan, neither the prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, nor the four caliphs ever came to this part of the world. So, that's just one reason. No country was born with two wings separated by a thousand miles of hostile territory. No country. The Americans understand it immediately when I tell them, can you imagine America coming into being with California and New York separated by a thousand miles of Russia? And they get the point. So, we were certainly the most uniquely created nation state in world history. I will not take you through each of those painful 14 failures, 6 falsehoods, 17 facts. Those who want to make the mistake of finding out what they are can ask me for a copy. I'll do it. But I'll pause at some. G. <coughs> the failures. The first and most fundamental was the disregard for the majority principle. The majority not only in terms of political voting, but in terms of language, which turned out to be a hyper-sensitive issue, as we know. So this disregard for who was in the majority uh, came from the very inception of Pakistan. Gee, uh, there's also an attitudinal behavioral bias, a lack of comprehension of the cultural truths of East Pakistan. We assume that just because women put on that ceremonial uh, dot on their forehead, uh, everyone is really de facto a Hindu, a profound insult to the totality of commitment which every Muslim Bengali woman feels for Islam. So we didn't really comprehend that. Yes, there were certain extractive exploitative aspects. We made inadequate efforts to redress the imbalance. We neglected it during the East Pakistan crisis of isolation, the 65 war, when less than a division was posted there, well less than a division. And so patriotic were the people of East Pakistan that they felt discriminated against, willfully disregarded, because the thesis at GHQ and Islamabad was the defense of the East lies in the West. And that vulnerability became the seed for six points. It's a disastrous uh, decision by President Ayub to violate his own constitution and disregard the fact that the speaker at the time was from East Pakistan. Gee. A man who started out with some very positive achievements, who held an election which even the Awami League uh, agreed was a free and fair election agreed to disband the one unit, agreed to abolish the uh, uh, parity principle, the market. And then, in complete contrast to those splendid opening actions, one catastrophic misstep after the other. Gee. The major flaws of his constitutional scheme, pre-constitutional scheme, the LFO, which had two lethal omissions. One, it did not specify on what basis the assembly would adopt a constitution. Uh, it is a standard rule across the world that a constitution has to be adopted minimum by a two-third majority, not by a simple majority. But the LFO remained silent on that issue. Second, it did not touch upon the very hypersensitive aspect of the six points. 
which should have been settled in advance provincial autonomy. And it was in January 1971, after the election, that dear General Yahya Khan and General Pirzada invite experts to make a presentation on the six points. They had not bothered to study the six points which had been the campaign basis for the Awami League. So, just a quick run through through those six points. First point, no problem. Federation based on adult franchise, supremacy of legislature. The trouble begins with that second point, that the center should deal only with foreign affairs and defense. Dicey question. Uh, two separate freely convertible currencies for East and West, or one currency but very clear restrictions on right of capital, and fiscal monetary policy separate for East Pakistan. And power of taxation, no power at all to the province, that is the Federation, G. Two separate accounts of foreign exchange and uh, the Federation <coughs> needs to be met uh, in ratio. And lastly, uh, potentially destabilizing one, a paramilitary force exclusively for East Pakistan. Please continue. So the failures continue. And it was not all the West's fault. In my humble opinion, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman showed a very, very uh, sad lack of grace in victory. He was invited by Yahya to visit uh, West Pakistan immediately after winning the elections. He declined to do so. And then came the hammer of it all, the most lethal decision that Yahya Khan took, which was to announce the postponement of the National Assembly session on the 1st of March through a radio broadcast, not even his own voice, no explanation given except that the other parties are refusing to attend. And therefore, perhaps accumulating in the insensitive, incompetent military leadership, both at the Eastern <coughs> Command, Dhaka, and in GHQ. And lastly, totally ineffective use of global media to project the actual facts of East Pakistan. They made India run away with the story. There were perhaps about six falsehoods that feature in that period. One, uh, this misrepresentation of what Mr. Bhutto had said. He never used those words, udhar tum idhar hum. This was the invention of a certain journalist. What he meant was that West Pakistan was a federation along with East Pakistan and that no constitution could simply be made by one province without the consent of the other provinces. The second, this calumny which still prevails and the Prime Minister of Bangladesh today continues to parrot this totally fabricated falsehood which is now part of the school textbooks of Bangladesh. Third, the unidimensional depiction of us West Pakistanis as haters of Bengalis and killers and rapists. And this calumny of very little development of East Pakistan. I'll just tell you what the facts were. Uh, 93,000 soldiers became prisoners of war, another falsehood. And that the two nation theory has failed. Let's go to the facts. Pakistan did not invent discrimination against Bengalis. Look at the abysmal record. In the very city where the Muslim League was founded, up to 1947, the leadership of the Muslim League holds only five out of 38 sessions of the Muslim League in Dhaka. And for over 20 years, 30 years in fact, only three Bengalis among 23 members of the Muslim League working. Gross under that. And this is the fact, low representation of Bengalis in the civil service, the armed forces. Uh, at the start of 1947, there was only one Bengali civil service officer in the government of Pakistan. Khal's speech, we all know, his unfortunate 
error, strategic error and conceptual error, G. However, the fact is also that there were tangible major improvements in those brief 24 years. This is largely forgotten. From one officer in the CSP, in 1971, 60 percent of government jobs were reserved for East Pakistani. 60 percent. And the representation had grown dramatically over a 24-year period. The growth in military employment was not as dramatic. It should have been more. But the inductions were as widespread, unfortunately due to a lack of training or inclination. Less than half of those recruited were actually inducted into officer ranks. And it is also a fact that the infrastructure, the managerial infrastructure of East Pakistan did not have the absorptive capacity. Just as today, the provinces of Pakistan do not utilize 100% of the budgetary allocations made every June. You find 20%, 30% unspent. Next, G. Very unfortunate, very slow, laggard D response, but the eighth is important. Could we go to the next one? Look at the voter, voter turnout. Despite 11 months of campaigning from January 1970 to November 1970, the voter turnout in East Pakistan was less than the voter turnout in Punjab and Sindh at 56.9%. What did this mean? Let me go. 43% of East Pakistanis were not bothered at all about the six points. They just refused to vote. And 11% actually voted against the Awami League. Thereby meaning 51% of the people of East Pakistan did not vote for the Awami League or for the six points. The majority. The very principle of majority which the Awami League was saying, we are the majority. But because of the absurdity of the first past the post electoral system, which we use in India, Pakistan, UK, uh, they got 160 out of 162 seats. G. And the fact of how many tragic killings took place, in first in that period from 1st to 25th of March, an outright mutiny within the armed forces. Uh, was a very sad but harsh fact. And I just want to run through a journalist who otherwise was very hypercritical of the army and actually published totally unverified reports in The Guardian, had this to say, that there was extraordinary discipline exercised by the soldiers in the face of provocation. And then most visible of all, unlike the Indian contention that uh, we, we had to invade Pakistan, East Pakistan. Of course, we had to save Hindu Bengalis on the 3rd of December. They actually started invasions on the 21st of November. Gee. And because of the, the bad things that some officers and many soldiers did, either unprovoked or provoked, the fact that thousands thousands of the armed forces fighting extremely formidable odds, a thousand miles from their supply points, totally surrounded on three sides by a vastly larger Indian force. Their valor and their sacrifices relatively remain unsung. And the actual scale of killing was far less, as you know. Can we go on? Dr. Kamal Hussain, who was the foreign minister for Dr. Oh, Sheikh Mujib Rahman, his son-in-law, an American, was castigated, convicted in Dhaka four years ago for questioning this mythical figure of three million. And he said, you know, William Drummond said it well, and he said it way back in 72. Please continue, continue with the court. Uh, he went around the country, couldn't find any sign because of the very simple, please continue, yeah. 
It's a completely absurd figure. Did you please continue? Because the ripple arithmetic that I did, on every single day for 262 days, 11,450 Bengalis would have had to be killed and 1,145 women raped every single day. Now, which army could possibly do this while also defending the country and fighting the Mukti Bahini and keeping law and order? I mean, it is absolutely so absurd and yet this myth exists in 2019. But there were undeniably, there were atrocities by both sides, a shameful part of our history. And sorry, could we go back? One must never forget that in this mayhem, there were many good people, both in East Pakistan and West Pakistan. There were many outstanding Bengalis who helped give protection to non-Bengalis. And equally, there were many fine, noble people from this part of the world. Everyone likes to say Mr. Dinah's two-nation theory collapsed. Well, what is Bangladesh today? It's proudly Muslim. It refuses to become part of West Bengal. It refuses to merge with India. It remains a Muslim Bangladeshi nation, as does Pakistan. And this is little reported or remembered. When Mr. Bhutto goes back to Dhaka in June 1974, he receives a thunderous welcome. A thunderous welcome. And who says this? J. N. Dixit, the Indian High Commissioner in Dhaka, writing in his book, The Liberation War. He says, I was so depressed that day because what I saw on the streets were people saying Pakistan Zindabad, Zede Bhutto Zindabad, India Murtabad. How graphically the mind had changed in less than two years, or just about two years. Amazing. Yes, please. Regrettably, today, there is such an intensification of the anti Pakistan virus by Hashina Wajid supported by India, execution of people who supported Pakistan, and Modi's damning speech recently in Dhaka says it all. So, let's go to the international part. We were the first state to disintegrate after the Second World War. There were varying roles of the US, the USSR, China, according to their own interests. There was a varying role of the United Nations. As early as the 30th of March, India urged the UN to intervene. UN Secretary General U Thant responded by the 19th of July. He said, okay, we are willing to send neutral, independent UN military violating what? India refused to accept the UN offer. So it's remarkable that on the one hand India invites the United Nations then realizes that it would be caught on the wrong foot, it would be exposed, so it turns away. Oh, sorry, could you go back? What was appalling was the apathy, the apathy to a blatant violation of state sovereignty by a country like India which crudely, openly uh, invaded another country's territory. Uh, well, please go back again. Because of our poor diplomacy, because of our failure to use global media, uh, by June is it, the UK government had suspended all aid to Pakistan, followed very quickly by a US House of Representatives resolution calling for suspension of all US aid to Pakistan. China, which urged a political solution, was vastly overrated by us, gross miscalculation. Uh, to our credit, by August, we had managed to get the UN General Assembly to pass a resolution overwhelmingly calling for a ceasefire. But as we know, a General Assembly resolution is not binding. It is only the Security Council where the Soviet Union uh, ensured that no uh, a resolution against India could pass. Gee. 
What I feel is a theme that emerged in 1971 and thereafter, that is the nation state as a concept of organized human settlement. Is it the most viable? Because throughout history, people have not lived in nation states. They've lived in kingdoms or fiefs or sultanates. So it went through a process of reconsideration, and yet we find that in actual membership terms, the United Nations grew. Uh, 25 out of the new members were as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Five members came from the Gulf, which became independent, Emirates in 1973, and then several came out of Yugoslavia, Ethiopia, uh, seceded, uh, Eritrea seceded from Ethiopia, East Timor held a referendum, South Sudan separated from Sudan much more recently. So, on the one hand, the nation-state concept has undergone stress and strain, and on the other, membership of UN is gone. But back to 1972, for a country that had been so devastated, where the majority had rejected the name of Pakistan, the majority, not the minority, it was truly a miracle to see how the people of Pakistan held on to the beautiful name of Pakistan. And to his credit, Zedeh Bhutto, with all his other flaws, infused a new dynamism in foreign policy. And that dynamism resulted in, first of all, a withdrawal from Seattle, the anti-communist alliance of 19, uh, in 1973, and later Sento in 1979. We introduced a new orientation to the West Asian nations, to the Gulf, OIC, we became a member of the non-aligned movement in 1979 after Mr. Bhutto had been executed. But the initiation of that process began after 72. So, Pakistan's whole foreign policy uh, orientation changed after 1971. And then came the culmination of our efforts with the holding of the Islamic summit in Lahore in February 1974. Uh, that kind of summit had not been organized before, never had so many Muslim leaders with such divergent viewpoints uh, come together, even though there were some abstentions. Deep. And India's internal turmoil, here is a country gloating from the victory over Pakistan, and yet it plunged directly into internal crisis. Mrs. Gandhi declared an emergency, and at the same time, while declaring the emergency, India started giving signs of a new aggression in terms of its relations with neighbors. Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan. In Bhutan, Bhutan cannot sign any agreement with a foreign country without the consent of the government of India. And even tiny little Maldives. So a new regional hegemonism emerged after 71. G. The nuclear explosion of 1974 forced Pakistan to go in for a secretly accelerated program. And then, to the credit of Pakistan, otherwise so defamed by this alleged rape and killing, genocidal killing, our resolutions calling for a nuclear free South Asia received overwhelming support in the UN General Assembly onward of 1973. And except for America, except for India and Israel, three or four votes against, 90% uh, of the members supported Pakistan. Despite the birth of Sark in 1985, India's hegemonistic impulses have continued. 1984, it violated the Simla Accord by occupying the heights in Siachin, from which it has now retreated. And therefore, Pakistan remained the only country able to challenge and deter India. 27 years after that debacle, both became nuclear weapon powers, which introduced a new maxim into their relations with other nuclear weapon states and with the rest of the world. G. G. So, to sum up, 
71 to 2148 years, my God, look at the changes. Internal changes within India, the Northeast, Indian held Kashmir, they can't afford to reduce their troop levels from 600,000 now up to 800,000. And look at what happened in Afghanistan. Two major world powers calling themselves superpowers, unable to score a victory right on Pakistan's doorstep. Bilateral, the dimension, sorry, could we go back? The regional, the global changes in connectivity, communication, and trade, the uh, whole world has changed. And yet it is the same. So, should one ask the cynical question? Are Pakistan's vital national interests at stake vis-a-vis -vis Bangladesh? Which vital national interest is threatened? Should we ignore it? It's not important to us. I mean, I'm deliberately taking a cynical view. Uh, is it so important to us in trade? Is it important to us in defense? Is it important to us because millions of Pakistanis are working in Bangladesh, like they are working in Saudi Arabia? Yet, one feels anyone who has been to East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, aha, Sonar, Bangla, Golden Bengal, beautiful country, beautiful people, their heart is good, wonderful human beings, and they have a soft corner somewhere hidden for Pakistan. So, the question then becomes under Hasina budget, is it realistic to expect better relations? Well, gee, well, in the service of history and the search for truth, I suppose we should make our public and our official diplomacy much more vigorous and strengthen relations. It is in our interest. Thank you for staying awake. Thank you. that Pakistan is not the only country in the world that has been divided or at the center. Pakistan was itself the result of the division of a country, the division of British India into India and Pakistan. Today, we see the division between North and South Korea, a strident nuclear North Korea, a South Korea that is allied with the West. We saw the disintegration of Yugoslavia, a country comprising disparate people, disparate people, who were held together by the brilliance and the determination of Marshal Tito, divided into Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, Slovenia, we also saw the unraveling of Czechoslovakia, divided between the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And the biggest of all breakups, that of the Soviet Union, which has changed the entire landscape and nature of global politics. So far as the loss of East Pakistan is concerned, it is, it was, at that time I was growing up, it was a catastrophe beyond bearing. But I think that no one political party should be blamed for that. It was a collective responsibility. And what st stood out was that there was a very strong between the policy makers in Islamabad and the sentiment of the people of East Pakistan. There was a strong disconnect. It is said that not much has been written or analyzed about such a great national loss. That our intellectuals, our historians, our public figures, <coughs> should have devoted 
far more time and analysis to such a great tragedy, to such a great loss. But I looked up the newspaper today, dawn, and it reported many, many street protests after the fall of Dhaka in all the major cities of Pakistan, in Lahore and Pindi, in Islamabad and Karachi. If you will allow me, I will make a personal statement so that what East Pakistan meant to us will come across more clearly. My ancestors lived in Panipat and in Delhi for 700 years. Since the days of the Emperor Balban, they traveled east as far as Burma, south as far as Aurangabad and the Nizam's dominion in Hyderabad taken. But they always kept their link those seven centuries with these two cities. And when Pakistan seemed to be a reality, my parents gave up everything. Their land, their property, their wealth, their status, their friendships, their linkages to move to Karachi. They took the train on the 12th of August 1947 and it took two or three days to reach Karachi. They were too late to join in the celebration of 14 August. But they then proceeded to sink their roots in their new land. This was their new land. And East Pakistan was part of that land. As Javed said, it was a dream. And so the loss of East Pakistan was for my parents' generation a very, very great tragedy. In this, we had many friends in East Pakistan. Politically, we knew Khadr Nazimuddin, Khadr Shahuddin. Mr. Fazlur Rehman, who was a minister in the cabinet of Prime Minister Yaqat Ali Khan. His son, Suhail Rehman, who is the leading industrialist today in, East, in Bangladesh, and whose son, Suhail Rehman, became a great friend of mine. Kamal Hussain, who later, later became for the Minister of Bangladesh, was a member of this institute. And he represented this institute in many parts of the world, at many fora. And I want to here pay a tribute. I may not have another chance to do so. Pay a tribute to Professor Abdul Razak of Dhaka University, who so affectionately facilitated my research. And when I was a member of uh, working in the National Institute of Public Administration, we used to take delegations to East Pakistan to all those cities, which are not, not just names for some of our young people, Dhaka, Chittagong, Mehman Singh, Rajshai, Kulna, and the Buri Ganga, on which you could go on a boat trip. But in subsequent visits to East Pakistan, I saw the change. And I remember one occasion when I went into a post office to try to buy some stamps. And nobody over there, none of the clerical staff would speak to me, would speak to me in any language that I knew. They wouldn't respond in Urdu, and they wouldn't respond in English. And because I could not speak Bengali, I could not buy that postage stamp. And so I left that post office very embarrassed and in great confusion. But for me, the change had already begun from the Humud Rehman Commission report. Every now and then, somebody or the other comes on the television and says that the report should be made available to the public. 
politicians say that, anchors say that, newscasters say that, television personalities say that. But the truth of the matter is that that report was made available to the public. It was declassified on the 30th of December in the year 2000. And the reason that it was declassified was a dramatic turn of events. The reason was that on the 14th of August 2000, Dawn newspaper ran excerpts from the supplementary report written by Justice Abdul Rahman, lifting it from India Today, the weekly, the Indian uh, weekly India Today, which had somehow got hold of that report and printed excerpts. At that time, we thought that the reason for choosing that time to print it was to deflect attention from the atrocities in Jammu and Kashmir. Javed Saab was a member of the cabinet at that time, and I was cabinet secretary. And so we were very bewildered as to what to do. And so we gathered together, and much to the credit of the government of that time, Edward Musharraf was the chief executive. We did not suddenly buckle down. And we didn't fall to the sensation which had been created by this amazing publication. General Musharraf constituted a committee comprising the interior minister, General Moinuddin Haider, I think it was, uh, the foreign secretary, Inamul Haq, and myself as cabinet secretary to go through the report and to recommend what should be done. So each one of us burnt the midnight oil and read that report. It was a very painful reading. And we recommended that the report should be declassified. And because there was so much hype about it and so much sensation, the cabinet division issued a press note, it is a public note, saying that in the public interest and because of the long demand that the report should be made available, it would be declassified on the 30th of December in the year 2000, the same year. And General Musharraf accepted our recommendation. We took great care not to declassify it near the Eid holidays or near the 16th of December when the real war, when the surrender, actual surrender took place in Dhaka at Royce Coast Garden, Race Coast, I think. I will now turn to the report itself, which is a most remarkable document. Many people have criticized it who have never read it. Many people have talked about it who never had access to it. It is a remarkable document because of the material which it deals with, its backup material, and because the material which it sifts is absolutely monumental. Within a week after Mr. Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto became, after the fall of Dhaka, became the President of Pakistan, <coughs> he appointed a three-member commission of inquiry into the 1971 war, headed by Justice Humudu Rahman, who was then Chief Justice of Pakistan, and with Chief Justice Anwarul Haq of the Lahore High Court and Chief Justice Tufair Ali Abdul Rahman of the High Court of Sindh and Baluchistan. At that time, that was one High Court. They were its members. And they were required to inquire into the circumstances in which the commander, Eastern Command, who was General Niazi, 
surrendered and the members of the armed forces of Pakistan under his command laid down their arms and a ceasefire was ordered along the borders of West Pakistan and India and along the ceasefire line in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The public, the public was invited to, to contribute. <coughs> excuse me, contribute. <coughs> the commission examined 213 persons, including members of the army, air force, and navy, political leaders, serving and retired civil servants, journalists, and members of the public. But Justice Mudur Rahman was aware that many of the main players in the tragedy of East Pakistan were then prisoners of war. And he tried to interview them through the International Commission, the Committee of the Red Cross, but he was not successful in doing that. So when the prisoners of war and the civil internees were repatriated from India to Pakistan after the Shimla Agreement in 1974, the commission was reactivated and it examined the evidence of 72 people, including that of Lieutenant General Niazi, Commander, Eastern Commander. Now in this report, which is very exhaustive, there were two reports. The main report, before the, the, the prisoners of war came back home, and the supplementary report, from which India today had quoted. In this report, the, the chief culprit is generally Yahya Khan. And the worst epithets, the most damning epithets, are reserved for him. And mainly because the justices say that he never really intended to transfer power to the civilians. That all his negotiations were fraudulent. That his assumption that the 1970 uh, election would give a divided vote, divided parliament, was wrong. And in fact, the Awami League came out victorious. The report gives a graphic account of the Awami League civil disobedience movement, which it describes as a reign of terror. And it believes that the army was at the receiving end of the Awami League's civil disobedience movement, cut off from supplies and food, and that it reacted violently. But Yahya Khan and his advisors should have realized that a military solution could not be forced upon one's own people, and the military action was immoral. And they write that he was insensible to the need of the, any solution and unaware of the danger of armed intervention by a hostile neighbor, India. Moreover, because of the war, two million people migrated from East Pakistan to India. And anybody who had any sense in his head should have realized that India had the sympathy of several big nations, including the Soviet Union. This war, this was a war, the justices wrote, in which everything went wrong for Pakistan. They were not only outnumbered, but they were also outweaponed. The supplementary report which was written after the returning commanders from East Pakistan were examined, makes very painful reading. More painful than the main report because it deals with the surrender of the armed forces. Every witness who deposed before the justices said that a political solution was needed and that many opportunities for seeking such a solution were lost and many windows of opportunity were closed. Those of you who, and there are some people from the armed forces here, would realize that the defense of East Pakistan was built around the concept of fortresses. 
There were 25 fortresses. Dhaka was a fortress which had to be defended at all costs. But unfortunately, it had to be denuded of regular troops to save the situation on other fronts. So there was, in fact, no plan at all for the defense of Dhaka. The report also addresses itself to the concept which Javed has referred to, that the defense of East Pakistan lay in West Pakistan, and that the Eastern Command would never have to fight any major battle with the Indians. I mean, it was a fallacy, the, the assumption that the Indians would not cross the border, would not cross the border into East Pakistan was a fallacy. And so the justice is right, right. Had the Indians amassed eight divisions, three armored regi regiments, two additional detached brigades, a parachute brigade, artillery brigades, 35 battalions of border security forces, 11 air force squadrons, two naval submarines, an aircraft carrier, landing craft, frigates and destroyers, only to fight a proxy war. This immorality, they wrote, was a perversity and was completely astounding. About the reference made by Javed to the three million people which East Bangladesh claims were killed, Bengalis who were killed, and the 200,000 women who were raped, that 26,000 persons were killed during army action, which may be, uh, I think, less than were actually killed. The report also goes into all the efforts, all the suggestions made by friendly countries that a political solution should be fought and the warnings given by some of them that India would invade East Pakistan, which was not taken care of or listened to. And uh, as Rao Sat Farwan Ali said in his deposition before the council, that simply there was no desire to give political prominence to the people of East Pakistan. I think I've taken enough time and I've tried to give a general impression, a general expose of the report, which I said is the most remarkable document. But one question which the report asks and which we may talk about if you like was General Niazi bound to obey, obey an order to surrender? The justice has concluded that he may have not been given an order to surrender, only permission to do so if it was necessary. Of course, as you all know, General Niazi, when he returned, he deposed before the commission and he has also written his own book, The Betrayal of East Pakistan in which he has given his own point of view. But there are the very sad details of the actual surrender ceremony. I want to end my oblique association with this chapter of our national life with the tribute paid by the enemy to our army. And I will quote from a book written by D.K. Patil, who was a major general in the Indian Army. He wrote a book called The Lightning Campaign, the Indo-Pakistan War of 1971. As Brigadier Tajamul Hussain, who fought to the end with his pistol before he was captured, stated, for a self-respecting soldier, Surrender is another form of death. He fought in the Battle of Hindi. The Battle of Hindi was one of the most hardest fought and famous battles of that war. 
and D.K. Patil writes about the bitter struggle at Hindi. The Pakistani garrison virtually had to be annihilated before the post could be taken. Whenever the Pakistanis decided to hold out, they fought ferociously. At Hindi, they held their ground with admirable tenacity. Though it was the courage of a desperate, doomed, beleaguered garrison, left with no other alternative than to fight to the last man. Indeed, it would be correct to say that whenever the Pakistanis were fighting from prepared positions, they fought with grim determination. The war was, after all, and these are my words, an unequal fight, man to man, weapon to weapon, aircraft to aircraft, warship to warship. We were outnumbered. And in the end, I'd like to say that anybody who had read history and who had even the slightest wisdom about historical events would have realized that the distress which partition had caused to the Hindus of India and to the Congress party. They would have realized that India would have left no opportunity, no opportunity to dismember Pakistan. And hence Indra Gandhi's triumphant reference to history after the surrender of Dhaka when she went to proclaim it in the Indian Parliament, she was profusely garlanded, and she described her victory as a deed well done, a deed well done. And even now, so many years after the fall of Dhaka, we have heard from Narendra Modi about the part which India played in the dismemberment of our country. Thank you. Uh, if it had been adopted or supported by Pakistan, it would have meant that the Indian troops remained in place, that Islamabad would cede political authority to the Awami League. There was no reference to what would happen to the Pakistani army except to withdraw, which was an impossibility. A peaceful withdrawal was out of the question. So while the Polish resolution is meant to have been an improvement on the Soviet resolutions which they had submitted, three, they had submitted three Soviet resolutions which had not been adopted because of opposition or dissent from the US and China and others, it is one of the several myths that surround that episode of the Polish resolution because it is contended that Zede Bhutto sabotaged any peaceful resolution by tearing up, which he didn't actually. There was another piece of paper he tore up. It was not the Polish resolution. And that we have it from people who accompanied him, who were seated with him at the UN Security Council. And the question of timing. Because of the time difference, uh, actually by the afternoon of 16th of December, the Indian troops had already entered Dhaka. The agreement had been made for a surrender. So uh, New York being 10, 12 hours behind uh, Bangladesh, behind East Pakistan, it was actually redundant. That was one of the ironies. And they did not know the unfolding situation because there was no satellite television at that time and there was no breaking news. But uh, the Polish resolution is a completely misrepresented talk. I was six years old when Pakistan was made. I joined the Navy in 62 and retired in 95. So 71 war, I participated on a ship. Uh, I have a feeling that uh, 65 war was unplanned, poorly planned, and fought before we were ready to uh, defeat India or get Kashmir, one, rest of it. But 
uh, our army fought, I mean, armed forces fought excellently in 65, and there was Allah's help also visible. Uh, uh, in the Hamoud Rahman report that you, uh, Commission report that you spoke on, uh, just adding on to what the gentleman just said from the Navy, uh, they mentioned a lot about the moral senior officers and wine and women and the lack of discipline. How uh, do you feel that important? You, you spoke about you know the guns to gun and men to men and ships to ship, but you know a lot of that was spoken in the report and they mentioned it quite thoroughly, especially even specifically with General Yahya. Uh, so how part of that is is that true or I mean I mean obviously there's certain elements to it. How uh, does that weigh into the equation? And if that is, is that something of concern that we should always look into the discipline of the army? Was that in question? And the second question is more a very specific uh, solution that was provided by General Yahya Khan uh, earlier, where he offered that Nurul Amin should become the leader. And I would like if Javed Jabbar Sahib if you could address that and why that didn't happen or try. Thank you. ...of the assembly that was virtually sealing it forever, but even then there was a chance. However, that decision on the night of the 25th to crack down on the Awami League was partly justified because intelligence told them that the Awami League itself was planning an armed action on the 26th morning. So by one interpretation of the documented record, I've read about 35 to 40 books, I can't remember the exact number. And I've tried to balance, you know, the military with the civil, foreign, independent, Indian. And one can't be absolutely sure whether that uh, intelligence was accurate or whether that is what prompted Jandiyaya. Because the indications are that he had already made up his mind to use military force to quell the situation. Uh, what inflamed him, according to accounts, was this open sight of Bangladeshi flags between the 1st of March and the 25th of March. And that convinced him that this was treason and this was a question of saving the state of Pakistan. He conveniently ignored all that he had done to bring about that situation. So the Nurul Amin offer was too late. I mean, it was no question of it being accepted because overwhelmingly, even those who had not voted for the Awami League had joined the, uh, the sloganeering for Joy Bangla, even though on the 7th of March, uh, Sheikh Mujib ended his speech, Joy Bangla and Pakistan Zindabad. But Pakistan Zindabad was drowned in the roar that followed Joy Bangla. So even till the 7th of March, there were people not wanting the complete breakup of Pakistan. So the Nurul Amin offer just didn't do it. <coughs> Well, the report is on the net, anybody can read it. So yes, there is a moral aspect to it. But gives is that the war was lost or the army didn't do badly just because the, the senior members of the army indulged in certain practices which you mentioned. That, that was restricted to a sorry that was, that was restricted to a handful. It did not apply. It included General Niazi who was notorious for using foul language and speaking very lecherously or inappropriately to his junior officers, but the overwhelming majority were not succumb, did not succumb to whining and drinking and womanizing. No, they didn't. Some of the, some section of the report were not published because of our relations with other countries. And, or, no, uh, when we, uh, yes, that you are right, when we released the classified documents, that <coughs> some passages were uh, withheld because of our relation, which dealt with our relation with certain countries. Uh, but they were very few. They were very few. Uh, you read them? Yes, I read them. Do you think they really warranted that they should be? Well, I think that now so much time has elapsed that even if they are made available, it doesn't matter. So, but are they available now? I don't think that that <laughs> was the science. For instance, as Mr. Javed Jabbar read it, and for now we no. are doing a post-mortem, so. Uh, may I get it? They were very few and they were withheld because of 
uh, certain, uh, you know, talks between us and uh, other countries. But I think, as maybe Javed will agree, I think so much time has elapsed that even if they are made public now, it doesn't really matter. So much has happened in the world since then. No, but I think we would like to know afterward when we see things historically to which countries were there. But there was a lot of speculation at that time, and especially for East Pakistan and the American warship coming there to rescue the forces. And I know there was so much of it. I think most of it was just advice that uh, there should be a political solution. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then it, it's a question of this kind of fundamental survival of the state. Several states, not just Pakistan, withhold documents on virtually a permanent basis. Uh, there are reports even in democratic <laughs> India which have not been released to date. For example, the Sundar Lal report on the massacres of Hyderabad Deccan people in the invasion in September 1948. That has never been fully declassified. Some parts were leaked. Some parts have been reluctantly released 40 years later, 45 years later. So some states treat that as almost sacred because they apprehend that this disclosure may adversely affect their relations with countries with which they currently enjoy friendly relations. So this is a subjective judgment. I agree that now, almost 50 years later, uh, documentation I think we should declassify the whole record, the whole report. But there are just a few pages. <coughs> one of the seventh speech was a, that was a very good speaker, one of the finest speaker you know I have heard. I would like to know what what about the other Tela Pulse PC case. You have not uh, highlighted about that issue because this was the fundamental actually thing you would like to highlight. Second thing, you have been telling that you must have a good relation with Bangladesh. That's good. We must have a good relation. But have you ever been to Bangladesh? You know, there were 10 journalists who were invited last uh, year in Pakistan and they, uh, one of the leaders was Hindu, the rest 9 were Muslims. And the Hindu leader of Bangladesh was a senior journalist. He was speaking against Pakistan, against Pakistan army and everything. So, when he went for Washington, the other journalists actually, there, there were other Karachi journalists and he told, they told us that if we speak against him or we just deny that Pakistan army did not do anything, any justice, they were <coughs> So he said that, that report will go to Hasina Majid and then we'll, our job will we'll, we'll do our job. So, and they said that almost East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, is a colony of <coughs> India. These are the Agartala Bangladesh case and the colony of India, Bangladesh. Thank you. Confirmed intelligence that two uh, representatives of the Awami League crossed the border to meet with representatives of the Indian Secret Services uh, in order to plan activities in East Pakistan that would sow discontent against West Pakistan. So there were sound uh, grounds for that. Unfortunately, due to the manner in which the political aspect was conducted by President Ayub Khan, Again, a completely distorted perception spread across East Pakistan that this is a West Pakistani conspiracy to stifle the rights of East Pakistanis. And therefore, Sheikh Mujib became a hero rather than be actually held guilty. And then finally, the government decided to withdraw the charges because there were West Pakistani leaders who also said it's a cooked up case. But it has now been confirmed by Indian intelligence agencies that they did meet with representatives. This was after the 65 war in that little town called Agartala. So 100% evidence that it was in the works as to how serious it was is another matter. Whether it should have been used or ignored is another political decision that a Yukhan should have taken. But he didn't take it and he uh, it misfired. Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, there is. I agree. Uh, India has so has so unhealthily taken over the psyche of many Bangladeshis. In September this year, we hosted an international regional conference, Asian regional conference, in Islamabad. To our delight, we welcomed 24 delegates from Nepal, several from Sri Lanka, 
even tiny little Maldives sent delegates. Bangladesh, two delegates. India, 14 delegates. When I asked the Bangladeshi uh, officer, and in fact he was an officer, he was not even a free delegate. I said, what is this? How do you explain this? He said, well, Mr. Jabbar, if a Bangladeshi gets a Pakistani visa stamped on his passport, he is not going to be ever able to visit India. Now that's the kind of fear they have installed. Halakye, Nepalese and Sri Lankans and Maldivians are willing to defy the Indian government. Bangladeshis have reduced themselves into this the psychosis of fear, uh, which is so shameful and so sad. Uh, it's very it's really pity. Friends with uh, General Arora's daughter, so we spent many evenings with General Arora. And General Arora said that at the beginning of the year, the decision had been taken that we will invade East Pakistan. And said it's only a question of that the preparation wasn't there. And many of the you know, commanders said, no, we cannot do it now. Let's wait and wait. But here in this country, in our, I mean, our governments were not realizing what was happening. And that's the kind of a thing that makes us feel very fearful even today of what's happening or later and so on. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. He was a very, very prominent, the most popular. Whenever I used to ask my students, they used to name only Javi Jabbar. I do not know what he did to them, but it was very difficult to get him. <laughs> Sir, I would like to quote two books for the benefit of all of us. One is, uh, the name of the book is Our Scientific Frontier. This book was written by Sir William Patrick Andrew in 1880, in which he gave the conception of Pakistan on the western side and the eastern side does not exist. Then Sir Prime Minister Attlee, while talking to the US ambassador in 1946, he clearly said that Bengalis are going to separate from Pakistan. We have decided to partition and Bengalis are going to separate. I have, a, I have brought a clip of Don newspaper. The most important, I have a book in my hand. This was written by my CEO, Brigadier Sahir Alam Khan. The elder brother of Shami Malak Khan. The name of the book is The Way It Was. It was published by Army Service Club on the personal order of General Parvez Musharraf in 2000 when I was commanding three commando battalion. This is the battalion which arrested Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and brought him to Pakistan, West Pakistan. Now sir, I shall just read four lines from this book, chapter 7, 146 page, number 8. Only four lines because you read many times. <laughs> <laughs> it's greatness of my madam that he, she allows me. I I am in habit of uh, explaining and talking too much. Sir, I just read, really, I promise, this is five lines. <laughs> promise, promise five lines. <laughs> Sir, it is written. A little while after the takeoff, the air hostess came and told us that the senator from Idaho was traveling on board and had asked if we could join him for a cup of coffee, which we did. My student, he went for course abroad in America. And this is August 1965. August 1965. After asking 
A few questions about Pakistan. This senator told us that East Pakistan would separate from West Pakistan. We were completely surprised by this statement and assured him that no such thing would happen. August 1965, in my very, very humble opinion, this was the geostrategic design which was conceived by Sir William Patrick Andrew in 1880 and it was executed in 1971. Thank you. To say that historically, even in May 1947, less than three months before the creation of Pakistan, Mr. Sauravardi uh, wrote to Mr. Jinnah suggesting, proposing an independent, sovereign Bengal, single Bengal. And Mr. Jinnah is quoted as having said, absolutely, I support the idea. He supported the idea of a united Bengal, not a uh, Thank you. He supported the idea of a sovereign, independent Bengal. But it was the Congress and the British who insisted on partition. And in fact, Mr. Jinnah went on to say, to imagine uh, Bengal, uh, East Pakistan without Calcutta is to imagine a man without a heart. Because the majority were Muslim in Bengal and he wanted Calcutta and non-Muslims to be part of that. And secondly, the uh, aspect of, I just want to use this opportunity to point out, I said 93,000 troops, the actual number of troops was not more than 42,000 maximum. Thank you for all. موسیقی और जिसमें they were trying to go for a constitutional breakup जिसको बुद्ध साहब ने भी एक्नॉलेज किया था कि they are going for a constitutional breakup I think मगर मुझे याद आ रहा है और उसको हमने रोकने की कोशिश की और जिसके नतीजे में ये प्रचलित हुए क्या ये हो सकता है a single state which is a confederation instead of a federation a very not a weak center but a center of much reduced activism and involvement and let the provinces uh, manage their own affairs optimally. Uh, confederations are rare in history. The one was the Soviet Union, which could not contain itself and broke up. So eventually it may have broken up. The so confederations are an untested, uh, untested category of nation states. So far, federations have worked, unitary forms of government have worked, but confederations are very difficult to find, successful confederations. Again, uh, a gentleman here alluded to the fact that, you know, the current relations between Pakistan and Bangladesh, the way they are going, why does our foreign office have to go head over heels to please Dhaka? Why in the world? Why do we need Bangladesh as a trading partner? We don't. We hardly have any trade to look at. And what do we do instead as Pakistanis, you and I? We travel to the UK and buy from Marks and Spencer every single shirt that's made in Bangladesh. We are contributing to their economy. Why do we have to do that? And why do we have to be so diplomatic in a diplomatic world to the extent that we take this insult of not being given visas to travel to their country? Despite the fact that financial institutions that are across with many geographies are investing heavily into Bangladesh and yet if there is a Pakistani involved the visa is denied. I think we should stop bending over backwards. We need to assert our dignity and we do not owe it to them. We have done enough. We have expressed regrets. There has not been a single word of regret. We will not regret no admission of the tens of thousands of non-Bengali who were massacred atrociously, children, women. I personally know 
of people who were killed so mercilessly. Not one word of acknowledgement, leave alone regret. Whereas we have at least expressed regret. General Musharraf went to Dhaka, said I deeply regret it. The Americans have never apologized for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There are hundreds and thousands of people, innocent people killed. And that, uh, that nation, sorry, I've stopped myself from giving an objective to that nation state. Uh, they have, we are in the PIIA. They have not bothered to apologize. No, we should express remorse and regret where it is due. They do owe us uh, regret for what they did. जो इसमें कॉन्स्पिरेसी इन्वॉल्व थी क्या हम आज पचास साल के बाद जो इस जगह पे पहुंच जिम्मेदार कौन था सियासी क्या आदत थी या फौजी की आदत इस पर कुछ रोशनी डाली दो वक्त की फौजी की आदत मैं सारे फौज को जिम्मेदार नहीं कह रहा हूँ उस वक्त के कुछ जनरल्स और कुछ हमारे सियासतदानों ने मिलकर ये तबाही हमारे पास पहुंचाई we should declare 16 December a day of reflection as Raza said, please remember it and we will try to learn from it and tell our children what the truth is. Assalamu and shirts from Marks and Spencer. But I think we should learn from uh, Bangladesh the way their economy has developed. It's, uh, it's a miracle. Uh, it's going beyond I mean, anything. I mean, they are developing. All the Dhaka is a pathetic city to go. I mean, those who have recently traveled to Dhaka would, know, would be knowing this. But their business and economy is developing. And unfortunately, uh, in our side of the, the West Pakistan, the Pakistan, it's going absolutely the 180 degrees down. I mean, we are, our exports are going down, and their exports are going up. So we should learn from that. Thank you. But do remember, Pakistan, for over 35 years, and more. They have enjoyed the least tariffs as a LDC. Yes. We have not had the benefit that Bangladesh exporters have in Europe, in the European Union, in North America. And despite that disadvantage, mashallah, we are trying to hold our ground. So people do not remember that Bangladesh has been given extraordinary concessions. <laughs> but that doesn't detract from the fact that women participation in the labor force is much higher than ours. They have done many more innovative things than we have done. And I admire that. And I respectfully do not agree with my dear distinguished friend about boycotting Bangladeshi goods. I wouldn't go to that extent. But I think we need to assert our own identity and dignity. Well, if there are no more questions, I will wrap up this session. Thank you, Javed Saab, for your participation in this uh, in this meeting and for your presentation, which has been much uh, admired. Thank you. And, uh, I'm May I say your presentation was very incisive. <laughs> I hope somebody would comment on it. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, everybody. And we can now wind up. And uh, there's a cup of tea waiting for you downstairs. Downstairs. Uh, on the ground floor. Okay.